Uh, welcome to today's talk, markers associated with the progression of type 1 diabetes uh, with Dr. Laura Elo, Professor of Computational Medicine, Head of the Medical Bioinformatics Center, and Dr. Rita Lahemsa, Professor of Systems Immunology, she's the Director at the Turku Bioscient uh, Bioscience Center at the University of Turku and Abu Akadami University in Finland. We're very excited to have them walk us through their work. And just as a quick introduction, um, Laura Elo, PhD, is a professor of computational medicine at University of Turku with a wide expertise in biomarker discovery and prediction of diseases and treatment risks in complex diseases such as type 1 diabetes. After a PhD in applied mathematics and postdoctoral research in computational systems biology, she became an adjunct professor in biomathematics in 2011. Since 2014, she's the research director at Turku Bioscience and head of Medical Bioinformatics Center of the University of Turku. Her research group develops computational tools to interpret high throughput omics and other digital health data in several projects. She's published over 150 research articles and over 20 software programs and has been honored um, with the prestigious JDRF Career Development Award and the L'Oreal UNESCO International Rising Talent Award. Um, Dr. Rita Lemanska is an MD PhD. She's a professor of systems um, immunology, and sorry, I'm just continuing to let all the people in that are joining us. Um, she is the professor of systems immunology and the director of Turku Bioscience Center, Turku, Finland, since 1998. She received her MD, PhD in immunology from the University of Turku. She was a postdoc at Stanford and a principal scientist at Road to Bioscience, Bioscience in Palo Alto. She's been a visiting professor at Harvard, Stanford, and UCSF. She founded and directed the Turku Center for Systems Biology from 2000 to 2015 and co-directed the Turku Center for Lifespan Research 2015 to 2021. She's the vice director of the Academy of Finland Center of Excellence in Systems Immunology and Physiology. Her research is focused on molecular systems immunology and aims uh, at understanding regulation of immune response and molecular mechanisms of T1D and other human immune mediated diseases. Her studies have resulted in the identification of novel molecular mechanisms and new regulators of T cell functions. She's the president of the Finnish Society of Immunology and member of the Board of Scandinavian Society of Immunology. She's published over 200 original papers and reviews and has several issued patents uh, and patent applications. So we've got two ex uh, you know, extremely well-versed uh, scientists in the room here in this space. And um, we, I'm very uh, happy to uh, welcome them both and very excited to hear what they have to share. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Monica, for a very kind uh... In, in introduction, and it's our pleasure to to uh, present uh, here tomorrow our recent recent work. And um, as said, we come from Turku, Finland, with southwest southwestern part part of Finland, um, and we we work in this building here on the seventh floor that you can see here. Beautiful. And, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> And and I I start with uh, with with acknowledgement. Uh, so so in in our groups um, we we have these people Tommy Tommy Sini Asta and Maria from Aura's group from me my group Carolina Upa Robert Omid and Inna Henna and Essi who have uh, participated to these studies uh, mostly in our groups. We are grateful for for our uh, co facilities at the center as well as many wonderful collaborators, Mikael Kniep, Harry Lähdesmäki, uh, Riikka Luntapio Lemberi, uh, Deep PIs and Inordia, Deep and Dibimu PIs, the families and, and the clinical personnel. And we are very grateful for all the grants uh, that we have gotten to, to be able to do this, this work. So uh, Taiwan diabetes, um, um, as many of you are very familiar with, but it's a immune mediated disease where both adaptive and innate forms of immunity play a role. Um, besides genetic component, it, there, there is clearly involvement of environmental factors. More recently, virus infections, microbiota diet have all been implicated here. And uh, in, in Finland, we have a record high incidence of type 1 diabetes. Um, why? We don't know. Uh, during the years, um, we have been interested uh, 
uh, with Laura in particular, uh, looking into very early stages of, of type 1 diabetes. Um, and uh, more recently, we, we have now, in the context of Inodia Consortium, been able to also look into the newly onset type 1 diabetes. And we have uh, split this talk so that I will start with the early stages and then Laura will uh, take it on uh, to, to discuss more re most recent uh, publications uh, based on Inodia studies. So I start by uh, Finnish uh, diabetes study, a uh, DIP study, which, uh, which is a prospective longitudinal follow-up study that started almost 30 years ago, um, where uh, they, they in Turku, uh, Tampere and Oulu, um, they, they screen uh, for HLA uh, class 2 risk uh, for genotype by genotyping. And then those who are uh, at risk are invited for a follow up. And um, today, uh, thanks to this follow up study, uh, over 500 uh, children um, have progressed to disease. And this, of course, uh, enables, uh, provides beautiful uh, cohort to be able to look into what the early stages, what might have happened early on uh, during their life. And well, almost 10 years ago, uh, we, we published this paper uh, where we, we actually uh, very interestingly were able to see uh, we tested the hypothesis that is it possible that already before seroconversion we can see some, some changes in gene expression profiles. And, and that was in, indeed the case, and, and it was uh, signatures of innate immunity activity. And this, uh, at the very same time, back to back, uh, John Todd's group, uh, together with uh, with Annette Ziegler's uh, group, they, they published a very similar finding back to back um, using different cohort and different technologies. And a year later, uh, we reported that uh, likewise using proteomics, mass spec based proteomics, uh, we could also see changes in protein levels already prior to uh, appearance of, of autoantibodies. So we went then on and, and we wanted to see, uh, can we, uh, if we, if we have more homogeneous group of children. Um, and, and this was possible because uh, Mikael Kniep in Helsinki University coordinated an EU study uh, called Dive Immune, EU funded study. And there we were able to, to get uh, samples from, from fairly homogeneous group, all of whom developed autoantibodies at an early age. And here we were able to study uh, frozen TBMC, which we were now able to to uh, uh, purify and look into cell-specific, cell-type-specific signatures rather than mixed cell populations. And just very briefly summarize the, the key findings. We reported this. Uh, first of all, there was a gene signature that we could identify again prior to autoantibody development in children who, who developed uh, this beta cell autoimmunity at a young age. And we also looked at uh, epigenetic changes, uh, namely DNA methylation. And likewise, um, the majority of them were cell type specific that we would have missed if we had looked at the whole cell populations. And furthermore, they were again, a significant amount of them were detected already before seroconversion. However, we couldn't see differences yet in the cord blood uh, at birth. Um, Moving on to to very recent study um, with where we we uh, followed up um, again on the deep uh, study and and uh, here we uh, looked at microRNA uh, that we had not yet studied previously and there are many uh, nice microRNA studies most of them are in the plasma or serum uh, here we decided to look at the cells so so these were whole blood samples taken from, uh, again, from, from uh, longitudinal study of DIP. And, and here you can see uh, the, the red are the longitudinal samples from those who developed later type 1 diabetes and, and blue are the controls. And in this longitudinal uh, setup, we were uh, 
surprised about this one microRNA that stood out. He thought it's an artifact, but uh, didn't seem to be. So here are uh, four case control pairs where you can see uh, samples taken uh, in, in a longitudinal fashion. And you can see that this microRNA was upregulated in each case compared to control. Uh, this uh, study, uh, we could validate this finding in much more samples. And most interestingly, uh, we could also show that, that it seemed that this, this uh, microRNA could even uh, predict uh, to some extent early on before seroconversion those children who would later develop type 1 diabetes. Uh, we analyzed whole blood uh, and we wanted to know where is this microRNA expressed. And very interestingly, when you fractionate the blood, it was particularly in the lymphocytes, not in, uh, for instance, granulocytes that compose most of the uh, peripheral blood, uh, whole blood samples. So to summarize, um, we found this microRNA. It's highly upregulated in whole blood samples very early on, already before seroconversion. It's expressed in lymphocytes, which gives us a handle to study it further. Nothing is, uh, has been uh, reported on, this, on the role of this microRNA, uh, nor its association with development of type 1 diabetes. And um, now we are, we are in the process of studying uh, what its targets might be and, and what it might be doing in these T cells. And then um, I will uh, move to the, to the other part, uh, give the floor to Laura, namely Inodia um, study, which, which is led by Professor Chantal Mathieu from Leuven. And um, uh, the goal of this has been to, to build the largest European network for studying type 1 diabetes, natural history, and prevention of loss of functional beta cell mass, identify novel biomarkers. This is something we have been involved with. Uh, with Laura, and then uh, most importantly, consolidate the clinical trial network where uh, several trials can then be uh, run in the future. So please, Laura. Uh, hey, thanks, have, Rita. Oh, sorry, I have a quick question in the chat for um, for both of you uh, from Nidigata. Which genetic technology, sorry, as we're switching over, did uh, you use for predicting the risk of type 1 diabetes? And what is the general function of HAS MIR 6868? Yeah, so so it is not known what what is the, I can take that, but so so what is the general function of this microRNA? It's it's not known. Very little is known about it in general. So so um, we and we don't know yet, but this is something we are very eagerly uh, in the process of study right and maybe maybe uh, laura would like to to uh, comment on on the other part so so regarding the technology i mean this was sequencing data that was used to to measure the microRNAs, and then it was validated using other technologies if that was the question yeah i i think so i, I mean some of the people are interdisciplinary scientists said thank you yeah okay Okay, so shall I continue? Yes, please. Okay, great. So, so as as Rit mentioned, so I will be talking about uh, two of our recent studies related to the Inodia cohort, uh, which is a, a big effort, uh, and and it's a, a global partnership between academia, uh, industrial partners, patient organizations to fight type one diabetes, and that is then focused. What I'm talking about. Uh, on the progression of type 1 diabetes from the newly diagnosed patients. And, and there is a large collection of blood samples and clinical data from these newly diagnosed patients, and also from their first degree relatives throughout Europe. And these samples have been collected uh, at diagnosis and then three, six, and 12 months after the diagnosis. And, and there is comprehensive clinical data uh, both during and then the first year after the diagnosis and also later. And then uh, different layers of molecular phenotypes have been measured. And I'll be talking about transcriptomics and proteomics, which have been our focus uh, in this study. Uh, 
And our aim has been to characterize genome protein expression changes in these newly diagnosed cases during the first year after the diagnosis. And we have been particularly interested in the heterogeneity between individuals and, and also how the changes are associated with the available clinical parameters. And then a specific goal has been to identify key genes, proteins and pathways that change during the first year and how these are associated with the rate of disease progression. And here's a summary of the data that I'll be talking about. So the transcriptomics data is genome-wide RNA sequencing data from, from whole blood cell uh, samples, and they have been collected at baseline and 12 months after the diagnosis. And we particularly focused on 46 newly diagnosed cases uh, who had samples and data from both time points uh, uh, in the first cohort that was collected in that, that study. And then the proteomics data are from serum samples, and they were measured using targeted mass spectrometry, uh, and the, it was targeted on 85 uh, type 1 diabetes associated proteins. And, and, and in this case, we have data from all four visits during the first year. And in addition to the newly diagnosed cases, we also have measurements from nearly 200 unaffected family members. And in this proteomic study, we focused on individuals below 18 years of age. But I'll start with a transcriptomic study, and it was recently published in Biomedicine, and here are the key people who have been involved in, in really doing the analysis, so Ubaid, Tomi, and Inna. So here we have the RNA-seq data from the baseline and 12 months after the diagnosis, and, and we are interested in the changes in expression between these two time points. And then clinical data are available from multiple time points, both during and after, after the first year. And what we first investigated was the overall heterogeneity between individuals in these gene expression changes. And this heat map shows the overall similarities of the individuals across all the genes. So each row shows the similarity of one individual uh, across all other individuals, which are the columns here. So red indicates highly similar changes, blue indicates opposite changes. So what we can see here is that there are groups of individuals who show similar changes, but, but there is also considerable heterogeneity between the individuals. So, uh, and I should also mention that, that the differences were not explained by any confounding factors like age, sex, hospital site, or, or technical factors that we tested. So first we wanted to see whether there are genes that change between the visits across individuals, despite the heterogeneity that we observed. And, and for this, we used uh, linear mixed effects modeling, where we can take into account confounding effects like this age, sex, and hospital site where the samples were collected. And this suggested that there are some potentially interesting candidate genes that show systematic increase or decrease from the baseline to the 12-month uh, visit. And, and here you can see the 10 uh, most significant candidates. And, and here are two examples to clarify what this means in more detail. So, so the expression levels here are shown over the age in these two examples. So each dot is a sample, and there is an arrow from the baseline sample to the 12-month sample uh, for those individuals who have measurements at both time points. So the arrow is blue if the expression goes down, red if it increases between the visits. So what you can see here is the systematic uh, changes. And then we also wanted to see if there are any biological processes that are enriched among those top genes and, and, and whether there are proteins that are encoded um, by them uh, that are functionally related to each other. And, and, and here uh, is visualized the protein-protein functional interaction net, uh, data, which was extracted from the string, string database. And, and here, just as for example, what we found was a downregulated module of genes that were related to immune response against bacteria. But, but then finally, in this study, what we did, we investigated if some of the observed heterogeneity would be related actually to the rate of the disease progression. And here we wanted to determine rapid and, and slow progressors. And, and what we used for that uh, C-peptide glucose ratios that were measured at and after the diagnosis. And based on the two-year data, we divided the individuals into three groups. So here you can see the red group with the largest decrease in C-peptide glucose ratio. It's, we call them rapid progressors. The blue group is, is called slow progressors. And then we have gray group, which is the intermediate group. And then we applied our reproducibility optimization method to identify genes that show differences between the rapid and slow groups. And we identified 16 genes that are visualized here as a heat map. 
And then finally, what we did, we developed this type of a, a, a risk score model using these 16 genes that we identified. And, and we could show that uh, this uh, score could stratify, in this case, the cases into rapid and slow uh, groups. But, but I'm not going into further details, but if you are interested in, the, in, in, in those, so all of that is available in this recent paper. Uh, and then I'll jump to the programming study briefly. Um, it was also uh, just published uh, online earlier this month in Diabetologia. And, and here are the two people who are, they're the keeper people working on the project. So Robert and Tommy, of course, many others as well, but, but they were leading from our side. And, and here we looked at the serum protein levels of 85 protein targets selected based on previous studies. And for the newly diagnosed cases here, we used all four follow-up samples during the, four, the first year after, after the diagnosis. And then additionally, we compared the protein levels to those uh, of, of autoantibody negative uh, unaffected family members. And when we compared the newly diagnosed individuals and the unaffected family members, uh, we saw significant differences in 13 proteins. And here are just two examples where the protein levels were higher in the unaffected family members than in the newly diagnosed individuals. So x-axis shows here the age and y-axis is the protein level. Uh, but, but then similarly as with the transcriptomics data, we were particularly interested in, in how the protein levels associate with these C-peptide glucose ratios indicating the disease progression. And, and here, uh, this was done by comparing the follow-up samples from the proteins with the corresponding C-peptide glucose ratios. And, and then what we found were 11 proteins that showed significant associations. And, and one interesting candidate, uh, which is shown here, is GBX3. And, and here the protein you can see that the, the protein is shown in red and then the C peptide glucose ratio is in gray. And, and if you look at the behavior, you can see that the, these two go to the opposite direction. So they are negatively associated. Quick question um, from uh, sure. Dr. Laura Jacobson at uh, in Flor U Florida. Uh, the question is age is in the model for the slow intermediate fast progressors? Question mark. Uh, which one? Age oh. is. Yeah, so asking in whether or not age is in is age included in the model for the slow so, and fast progressors, and she can so, answer so, herself as well and ask the question, or just clarify in the chat as well. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we have taken uh, age into account uh, as much as possible in the models, so they have been taken into account uh, in this. All the individuals are, are, are uh, below eighteen uh, years of age. But in this model, it's not there. It's the, I mean, here we look after the diagnosis. So, so there are these certain levels of, of, of differences that might be there, but, uh, but in this particular one, it's not. But it's in the, when, when we have, for instance, these mixed effect models, there we have age uh, in the model. Okay. I don't know if this answers the question. But... Great, it, 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 it might be unpacked in the paper as well. Yeah, definitely. The details are all there. Yes. Great. Thank you. So, so this is actually my, my final result slide related to this GBX3. Uh, so here we looked at the GBX3 changes between the baseline and the 12 month sample. And, and then if we look at the changes, so uh, we always use the individual as its own control. Uh, so then we can di divide the individuals based on whether the protein level increases or decreases. So uh, here on the right, you can see uh, uh, the, the, uh, in red, you have the individuals uh, where the GBX increases and on, on, in blue on the left, uh, those where it decreases. And it, so each dot is, is one individual. And, and then y-axis shows the C-peptide glucose ratio at a two-year visit, which is then actually one year after the data that is shown on the x-axis. So so what we can see that we can see here, clear negative uh, association between these two. And, and that is even maybe more clear from, from this figure, where you can see that the individuals, if you divide them based on whether the GBX3 increases or decreases, you can see that uh, uh, there, those where the GBX increases, there is large decline in the C-peptide glucose ratio at two years after the diagnosis. 
So to conclude, uh, we identified multiple genes and proteins that were differentially expressed between baseline and, and the one-year follow-up. Uh, then we identified a signature of 16 genes that predicted rapid and slow progressions, and then this act was actually also validated in, in an independent data set. And then the proteomics revealed a protein whose change was associated with the rate of the disease progression. And this is the same slide as Rita already uh, showed, so uh, I just wanted to emphasize that this is really a large effort involving many people, so I'm very thankful to all our collaborators and supporters. And I finally wanted to show here is my group, and, and thank you. I'm, I'm happy to 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 have any questions. Maybe I'll stop sharing now so that we can see better. That's great. Really wonderful talk. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I have a question from uh, Emra Altenis Lab. They focus on the microbiome. Uh, Kiati Gerd is a postdoc there. She's asking, is the upregulation of MIR6869 observed exclusively in the new onset T1D patients, or is it also found to be increased in individuals with established T1D? Additionally, is the expression of this miRNA limited to lymphocytes, or could it potentially exhibit an increased signature within beta cells as well? You can read the chat. I know it's a long one. Who would like to feel that one? I mean, this um, microRNA was actually identified before, very early on. So maybe it was a bit confusing because we were talking about two different aspects. So, so it was actually in these uh, early samples before the diagnosis, this microRNA. Okay. Um, can, I, can I speak more? Yes, sure. Go, go ahead, Kiari. Yeah, I, I did understand it was in very early onset. The question was, is it like uh, with also stay uh, increased with the diseased uh, development? Like as the disease progressed, the level of the microRNA still stay increased or it just during the early development? Um, anyone? Do we Rita, have data on those newly, uh, I mean, this after disease onset on this microRNA? We we have done a small pilot study, and and also in Inodia, we we have an other group uh, who works on microRNAs, particularly uh, Guido Sebastiani uh, and Francesco Dotta, and uh, they have not uh, seen uh, upregulation of of this gene in 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 their data. Set. Uh, that was something we were very eagerly looking into. Into, but uh, as as the, as Laura said, this really is at very early stages where where these results came from. Early early stages of the follow up of these children. Great. Um, I wanted to circle back to the whole, you know, the downregulated genes enriched in the immune response against bacteria slide. Um, can you, you know, kind of, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, maybe even a hypothesis around mechanism there? Well, well, we, we think it's, it's possibly possibility that, that indeed this, this, uh, may, may have an important impact and uh, that on the other hand, we don't know, we, we are again, uh, looking at the periphery and, and not the site of, uh, inflammation hmm. but but um, it is possible that that this is related related to to uh, especially some some may be more susceptible susceptible for some bacterial infections because of this uh, decreased immune response yeah it's fascinating we have a panel coming up to speak on the impact of the microbiome in context of type one diabetes in October. And um, we have a couple of experts from Europe as well as the US and Canada speaking. So that should be kind of an interesting conversation as people kind of gather more and more information around the, you know, what the microbiome is actually doing as people, you know, generate autoantibodies and progress towards type one diabetes. Here's a question. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I was going to just to add that that uh, in Inodia uh, there is also 
microbiota is also being analyzed as we speak. Yeah. Uh, and that's effort by, by Mikael Kniep and, and his group. And it will be interesting then to be able to, it's from the same patients, from the same follow-up samples. So it will be very interesting to be able to also look into that there. Yeah, it'll be fantastic. Um, you know, we're speaking with Johnny Ludwigsen as well. You know, he's been kind of very involved in there, in that, and Eric Triplett um, coming out of Florida. So it's really exciting times. Um, I, here's another question from Ruby Sharma. Sorry if I missed it. Have you looked at both upregulated and downregulated miRNA? Yes, you may have missed it. <laughs> but if you guys can just answer that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think we looked both ways, but this particular one was the only one that was clearly different between the groups. So, I mean, it was it was upregulated and, and that was kind of data driven, the first analysis. And then, of course, the validations focused on this particular one, with, which was very clearly different between the, the groups and was the only one what, that was so, so significantly different. This is sort of a global question, you know, um, for some time. Finland has been number one for type one diabetes um, diagnoses, and I believe Sardinia is a close second. Um, is there any kind of insight as to, you know, why that might be the case? Um, and in context of the work you're doing. I must say that I, I don't know, but I can see here actually Rita, other Rita from Finland. So I wonder, do you Rita have some ideas about this? Is she there? <laughs> I think so. Time to un unmute. Uh, let me see where. Uh, who is it that you wanted to have unmute? I see Rita, other Rita Veijola. Um, and I was wondering if she might might have yeah, I see her about this question. Let me ask her to unmute. Rita Veijola, would you like to speak to that? Comment? Maybe not. I've asked her to mute. Yeah. So uh, I I don't I really don't know, but maybe someone else in the audience have given this a thought. It would be yeah. I mean, this yeah. obviously is a huge global question. I just didn't know if there, you had any sort of like high level thoughts regarding your work and how that might mm -hmm. you know, relate to this sort of large. Um, you know, large incidents of type one. And then I guess in terms of, you know, I just wanted to tap on the, um, the importance of the work you're doing and say, you know, um, it's just amazing how much work is coming from your group and others in the Enodia um, you know, consortia. And uh, that I think it's such a, an amazing thing that Enodia has built. Um, and importantly, you know, as people are trying to find windows of treatment um, as those progress to type one and, and, and are diagnosed with type one, identifying these types of biomarkers is so important and you're doing such great work. Uh, so it's, it's so, so appreciated. Thank you. And, and what is really appreciated are all these families, these clinical centers, families uh, who, who come to give these samples. It's amazing, completely amazing what commitment they have and have yeah. had during these decades now in, into these studies. So that's uh, really respectful. And hopefully, um, it, it would be nice to hear from the audience. What do you think in 10 years? Is there going to be a cure? Is there going to be a possibilities to prevent type 1 diabetes? Yeah. Yeah, he says yes. The, the million dollar question. <laughs> um, and I think that I think that many families do participate because it is such a 365, you know, 24-7 disease. There's no um, there's no there, there's no time off from it. So uh, people are very eager to see it cured. Um, yep, well, we've got a, a last call for questions here. I think we're getting to the bottom of, a, we're getting to 1230. Here's one, Heather. Thank you, Heather from Florida. Is there a significance with the gene GPX3 
with respect to the finding of the negative relationship with C peptide production. So if I take it correctly, so so these are now significant statistically what we find. Of course, it needs further validations and, and whether that is then relevant in, in other ways. These are now, now statistical results and in that sense they are significant. And maybe to continue, what, what is also nice is that in, in Nordia, uh, this was based on so-called what we call first 100, first 100 that were diagnosed with, with type 1 diabetes. And now uh, the analysis is going on on the next 150. And, and uh, that enables then us to, to validate, at least in this cohort, to some extent, uh, these initial findings. Yeah. More data, more power, more, more significance. So, um, well, thank you both again for joining us. I would urge everyone on the call and those who listen after this um, to the recording to uh, check out the the new paper. It's a really it's a really interesting paper, and um, and all the other work that's coming out of your laboratories. Appreciate your being with us today, and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.